what um, started in the 60s uh, with the digital computer art got into animation, it got into interactivity, and uh, it also made computers accessible for anybody. This is the subject of personal computing. And our next speaker is one of the pioneers in this field. Uh, it's Geoff Davis. Um, he is a generative artist who founded the Micro Arts Group in 1984 with the goal of supporting artists and making computer art accessible to the public. So, Geoff, it's a real honor to have you here. I'm just looking around with the lights. It's a bit difficult. Uh, would you please come on stage here? It's wonderful to have you here telling us how the computer world got into PC world and everybody could use it and do art on its own. Thanks. It's great to be here at this incredible event. Uh, thanks to the Herbert Franke Foundation, uh, helpful staff, Susanna, everyone who's helped me uh, on this voyage to this uh, podium. Um, now, this talk, uh, is more of an overview. I think we've had a lot of very detailed talks so far. So um, this one might be more of an overview, perhaps an interlude or something to relax a bit. I'm going to talk through um, what I did with microarts back in the 80s and uh, also go through what actually happened in the 80s generally. So rather than looking at things in a, a lot of detail, it's more of an overview. Um, so I think that'll make a change from the talks we've had so far. Uh, and I've arranged it such that I go on to the, my background and more detail on micro arts itself later on in the talk, in case we run out of time. I, I don't think we're going to run out of time. And then I'll briefly go on to my current research, uh, which is into AI and text generation at the uh, UAL, which is University of the Arts London, at the Creative uh, Computing Institute in Peckham, Anybody knows London? It used to be Camberwell Art College many years ago. Um, now then, next slide. Hang on. Sorry, I'm used to doing Zoom talks, actually. I haven't done a real talk for ages. So I'm imagining I'm in a giant Zoom experience. So, so uh, I founded MicroArts Group in 1984. Um, I'll go into my background a, a bit more detail because I think we should just go at the overview level to start with. Um, now, MicroArts... It was quite successful in the 80s, but it didn't really impact on to the professional graphics like SIGGRAPH or, or academia, because at the time I was operating independently. Um, and I go into my background in the sort of, what's the kind of bohemian arts scene in London at the time, which was very active, but obviously kind of underground in a way. Um, now, MicroArts was revived by Professor Sean Clark of the Computer Arts Society in London, or in England, um, now, he was very helpful. I mean, initially I met Nick Lambert and uh, Paul Brown. They were quite, Paul Brown's very famous. Nick Lambert used to be the chair of the Computer Arts Society. Sean is now the chair. But they were very enthused by microarts because there is a discussion that the 80s was a kind of lost period for computer art generally. So I had all of the microarts material archived. And uh, you know, it was all brought out, put into the archive as the first big independent uh, group to go in. Right now, I'm doing uh, research into AI, which is my sort of current focus, really. Uh, I'll go into that a bit later if we get the time. So, um, there, Sean wrote an academic paper about it. In, I mean, that's already three years ago, uh, revisiting and representing 1980s microcomputer art. And since then, we've had, had a few exhibitions in England, which was fantastic after all those, those years. Because initially, in the 80s, it was only exhibited once in 1980. Five, I think it was, at the London Filmmakers Co-op, i.e. not a gallery. Um, since then, exhibitions in Zurich, Berlin, which is my kind of European connection. So I thank uh, Geert Back when he was at Elementum for the Zurich exhibition and Annika Meyer in Berlin Expanded Art, who've been really supportive to, to the whole microarts project and, and me as an artist. So these are some shots of the... Um, 
the gallery exhibition. So the one in this, this music was going on at a, the end party in the Leicester show. So um, one thing to mention is that all of the micro arts work was sort of live computer work on microcomputers, and it only got printed now for these exhibitions. So it never existed on prints before. Uh, and then we showed some videos, that's from Zurich. And the, uh, there's a video piece being shown in uh, Annika's gallery in Expanded Art, uh, right now, in fact. So you can all get down and have a look. So the title of this, this uh, talk, Small is Beautiful, it's a book by Schumacher, 1973, which I don't know how many people have, are aware of. But it's quite an influential text. Uh, about human scale economics, anti-globalist, you know, more democracy, um, and all these kind of ideas, you know, they're still in debate now. Uh, 1980s, in the computer world, over that decade, there's a rapid decrease in hardware size and increase in power, and this is all based around Moore's law to do with, you know, just technological change. And there's all sorts of debates about, you know, which comes first, the hardware or the, you know, or the artifacts. So I'm not going to really go into any of these debates because this is quite a short talk. Now, this low, also, everything dropped in price from you know, the big mainframes, mini computers, which were really expensive, down to the sort of things a small office could afford or even a home office with the microcomputers. So it's decentralised, networked, easy to use. Um, 1980s art is also known for a, a small palette, so that kind of ties in. Uh, the famous 8-bit colour palette, which is very bright and sort of positive and exciting kind of palette to use. And I think the 80s generally have that vibe of um, a lot of activity, a lot of things changing. I mean, it's when sort of techno music started and electro pop, uh, you know, MTV, all these things are tied into this technological change over the 80s. Now, um, a bit about the bits, but don't worry about that. In the UK, there was a really big... The microcomputers came out in the early 80s. Uh, there was a big micro scene. Now, I've talked to people in Europe about this. And in Europe had the demo scene, which never happened in Britain. It was always the micro scene, you know, microcomputers. And nobody really knows what a micro is, I think. It's like a, a funny term. Um, but in the UK, it definitely meant microcomputers. There was a big industry around it based mainly on games and a very young audience. Uh, so people had these micros at home, they're very cheap, they learned to program, and people you know, moved, moved, naturally moved into the industry. So everything was kind of happening at the same time in the 80s. But the terminology is odd, I must say, that micro, micro arts, it's a, it doesn't sort of connect a bit with microcomputer arts, it perhaps makes more sense. So um, now I'm going to do an overview of the 80s, looking at different things that happened, because I think... With such a big, you know, 10 years to talk about, I can't go into too much detail, uh, and I'll go into micro arts later. So, um, the main thing about digital art in the 80s was that uh, paint box software was created to be run on the computers. So, instead of having to code the art, you could just make digital art and make digital artifacts for the digital industry. So, it's all tied together. So, the programmed art was still around, and when I did micro arts work, I was inspired by, you know, Franca and all the, all the great names from the earlier art. But it was very much like looking in, in the books and seeing what there was, maybe the odd exhibition. But there were very few things going on in those days. So, I mean, I was inspired by the older scene, but most people didn't really know anything about it. And the big enthusiasm for the microcomputer scene and the small computer scene was that it was new and exciting. And the history was kind of forgotten during that period, I mean, even until a few years ago. Uh, there was no sort of active interest in it. Um, so the bespoke programming, I think, has an artisanal approach to art. And the digital market needed digital logos, photos, branding, audio. So it all had to be produced digitally. So the tools appeared and it all happened together. Now, maths-based art appeared using fractals in the, in the 80s. Uh, and that was quite a big deal. I, I ended up teaching at an art college and the students were very interested in fiddling around with you know, fractal sets and doing these strange visual things on the screen. Um, and that led into the work that William Latham did, for instance, later on. Uh, 
And these were, and also the other thing about the 80s was all of the things happening were popular. They weren't individualistic things. They weren't in a research centre or in a university somewhere. This was all happening in the public arena. Um, but as Sean says, he calls it the lost decade. Uh, most of the new art that was produced was not saved or exhibited or it rapidly became obsolete because the hardware wasn't around. And that happened in the 90s with things like uh, um, Flash and all those technologies that within a few short years they've become unplayable. So this is a, a book, Beauty of Fractals. This came out in 86 and was a big uh, seller, inspired a lot of people. Um, that's looking at the math. So that was this math art thing that took off a bit. Now... Later on, uh, I did some research into user interfaces and zooming interfaces in the noughties and brought out a few um, creativity software tools for writers, which I won't go into in this talk. But um, as I mentioned, the artist didn't want to code. So the main things the microbes were used for was word processing, education and games. Paint box programs appeared in the 80s for the ZX Spectrum, which was a British one, and also things like the, you know, the Apple Mac came out, um, PC, all these had word processors on. That was a really big area of use. And also games were, were enormous for the microcomputers. Um, paint box programs digitized analog techniques. A lot of the things like color filters, effects, montage, vector draw, animation, they were all things people did anyway. Now we had some paint box work in our magazine. We did a print magazine. And we had a French artist showed some paint box images in 1984. Andy Warhol, Debbie Harry, this was a really big event. Um, he uh, did a, some paint box work live on TV with Debbie Harry. This is some other work he did, reproducing his work. And Keith Herring also used um, paint box in 89. Now, this is just using it to recreate their existing work. So another area of 1980s technology art was mixed media artists using, um, well, using computers in their work. I mean, Nam June Paik was, was mentioned earlier, uh, programming. These artists inspired a mass audience. Now, Laurie Anderson, who's kind of not really thought about much now, but she, she was very popular in the 80s. She did a lot of performances and was a big music uh, um, Seller, really, I think the single O Superman might have been a hit everywhere. Uh, Andy Warhol. Now, they came out of experimental art rather than fine art, and they, they weren't academic either. So Anderson was poetry, music, and performance. Warhol's obviously illustration initially, and then, you know, art, printing, film. Andy Warhol might seem less to do with generative art, but he was making multiples of his work in silkscreen, and he was just an inspiration to a lot of young artists because he'd worked with, you know, he'd done covers and worked with the Velvet Underground. Um, very well-known artist and, and popular, sort of mass appeal, if you like. This is a cover of a Laurie Anderson album from 86, I think. No, earlier, 81. Big Science. I thought I'd put this one up because it has science in the title and, you know, this is a talk about art and science, generally. Now, she, um, she came from an art scene that, included experimental music. Uh, Tony Conrad's not very well known, a lot of beat poets and so on. So I'd say that the art scenes in uh, New York and London had this big bohemian kind of scene going on, which led, you know, fed directly into computer art. This is the Warhol show. I think it was Saturday Night, Night Live, 85. So you've got, she came, went from Debbie Harry to Deborah Harry because she was on TV, I think. Uh, signed by Andy Warhol. Um, the expert's wearing a tuxedo, which is kind of odd. So, and this is his, you know, the big piece, which obviously is, uh, you know, it looks like a Warhol piece with the block colour, very flat image. Now, cyberpunk. Um, Franco was a writer of science fiction. Uh, cyberpunk starts, you know, appeared in the 80s, and this all fed into the kind of futuristic technological vibe of the decade. Um, William Gibson's a big name in that area. You've got also Bruce Sterling, did the Mirror Shades collection. Neil Stevenson's a really huge writer. He did a cyberpunk novel in 92. Cyberpunk now has its own palette. 
So this 8-bit palette is also a cyberpunk palette. Um, cyberpunk, which I assume everybody knows about, living in the network, AI, overlords, noir crime, drugs, brain damage. So that's kind of interesting. It was games, art, lifestyle, and movies. Now, Liquid Sky is quite an old one that's worth checking out. Uh, and Lawn, Lawnmower Man's a bit better known a bit later. That's the first edition cover of um, Neuromancer, which was a huge sci-fi novel in the 80s. Uh, the other thing about the microcomputer industry in the 80s was that the games, games was a major part of it, really. And uh, this led to a lot of techniques appearing before people, especially young people, such as 3D landscape generation, you know, uh, sprites, all this kind of stuff um, used in games. And then that appeared in artworks. And the other just a basic concept is interaction, which often is just not in art at all. But games are just full of, obviously, they are interactions. So this, this mix is always interesting, I think. Um, OK, thanks. So. Uh, net art arrived hypertext. Now, the 1980 computers went from mainframes all the way through to modern graphics computers, and I worked on these. That was the, I mean, they were all around at the same time. This was the whole change. Okay, I go through those microcomputers. Now, my background was the experimental art scene. I appeared in videos with, I made videos. I was at the Filmmakers Co op, did work with bands. Um, Lee Bauer is a performance artist. He's got an exhibition next year. At the Tate Modern. So there's quite an active scene. Now, um, microarts was dormant in that period. That's why I set up microarts. Um, we did four curated sets and a magazine, and we ended up on Prestal. Now, um, Harold Cohn was, was going to write for us. That never happened. But he advised me that art is all about marketing, which is quite good advice, I guess. 1985, microarts went on to Prestal. Now, that's cassettes we did distributed on data cassette. And here's some of the art. Now, there were different types of art. There were many different types of, uh, sort of generative or algorithmic art. Oops. And also, we did programs that were more unusual. So we had animations about UBI, Universal Basic Income. And we did a pixel program that took two years to run. Now, I'm going to ask to sh show a video of uh, MicroArts 1 now, just because these were mostly animated. We've got a video set up at the back. So this was the, um, the first release that came out. It's called Abstract Originals in Quotes, because you know, that's still debatable, isn't it? Is it abstract? There were menus on the programs. Certainly the graphics programs all had menus. And uh, they were animated. They built up their this is lines. This is the first set of graphics. There were seven programs, different programs in one data cassette, and one of the programs is showing expanded art in Berlin at the moment. So uh, this is really speeded up, but the idea was it was ambient graphics to run in the background or whatever you might be doing. So, you know, they still look quite good now. And again, they have that classic uh, sort of programmed art look about them. And this 8-bit palette, which of course is um, very bright, uh, quite simple, quite impactful. Later on, I mean, just recently, we did some 3D cubes using these graphics and put synth music on, which was a set that came out on Elementum, if you want to look it up there. So we've sort of reprocessed these a bit recently. So that rapidly has gone through this one, and then the next one, Start, which is, again, a simple, simple idea. But um, So I just whizzed through these. Um, we had other programs based around... Mondrian, Moybridge, there's a whole range of things. They're all online. Now, I said there wouldn't be a lot of time to show the actual work. So if you go to, um, oh yeah, I did the text generation back in 85. It's AI, it's AI story generator, which has been exhibited. We did a magazine. We did some Quantal, well, Quantal type of work. And this is a French artist who's still an artist now. And this was in our magazine. So that was 80, 84 or so. You can see it's quite nice work, and it ended up in black and white in our magazine. We ended up on Prestal, which was a teletext system, similar to Minitel, which you get here, or France, rather, a long time ago. I write fiction. 
I had a few cyberpunk novels out myself, and two of them, one came with a game, one came with an online uh, sort of piece. Um, and at the moment, I'm an AI researcher at UAL, and I'm looking into, I did a lot of work with professional writers, researching their attitudes to using AI. And I'm, last year, I did something on mood bias in AI chatbots. We had this setup where the, you give images to the computer, the AI, and ask it to interpret them to find out its emotional state. I mean, I'm using this sort of metaphorically. So the, that's like a role shack for a robot. There were a lot of these very geometric images rather than the um, ink blots which we used in the original series. Um, so thanks, everyone. I think I've hit my time just about. That's good. Uh, you can look at microarts.com. JeffDavis.org is my main site. Microarts has got all the graphics. There's videos on there. There's loads and loads of material. Uh, there's a QR if you want to do that. Um, I'd thank Computer Arts Archive for you know, uh, revitalizing everything, really. It's uh, quite a turnaround. Uh, Lorandum have, have supported me a bit. That's great. And in terms of resources, they have a lot of resources. Computer Arts Archive is not just Microarts. There's lots of other work in there. Obviously, Lorandum are, are massive now. And um, that's it. I shall stop there. <laughs>